Okay. I think we're. I hope, I hope the new layout of the room is not is not too uh, upsetting. Uh, hello, 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 hello. I'm so glad you're here. Great to see you. Try a different configuration. Actually, this was the configuration we had. Uh, I've I told in the past before we had that screen. Um, so it's something you should make it easier to um, record uh, without being too disruptive and also uh, prevent the entry to be uh, in the visual when people do come in uh, a bit late. Uh, so that you know you have fewer distractions and you can focus on what the speaker is telling. So that's the end. <laughs> but you should, could and should take more hello, uh, hello, hello. advantage of these um, lectures. So, well, I mean, I introduced to you Bishop Franklin last time. I have to say that I've received this, a kind of a string of emails uh, and reactions and feedback of people enthusiastic about well, thank you. And thank really you. absolutely thank you. rave about it. Thank you, so thank you. I appreciate it. Well, we'll hear, see, we'll see. <laughs> yes, to hear the following about uh, Ralph Adams, Cram, and the architecture of St. Thomas so, Church. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you for being here again. I, I appreciate that. And I also want to thank my, my colleague, Jerry Wolf, who is uh, another bishop in Long Island. So you think our diocese is taking over New York. <laughs> it doesn't, two bishops from our diocese, but we are very close colleagues. And usually we're going out to parishes in our own diocese, which includes Brooklyn and Queens, doing visitations today. But both of us don't have one to do. So. Um, I'm so happy that she's here today. And she can ask me questions because she does every day. We take the train every Thursday and gossip all the way to Garden City, <laughs> Long Island, and we gossip all the way back. And we just hope that people from other churches are not hearing what we're talking about. <laughs> so it's wonderful to see you all here uh, today. So this is the second of three lectures. The first was about Bishop Hobart, who's really the founder of this church, and I'll repeat some of the themes for those who weren't here last night. Today, we're talking about Ralph Adams Cram, the great architect of the church. How nice, we don't have to have slides because we're sitting in the middle of the building we're talking about. I mean, we're in the artwork that this lecture is about. And then the third lecture is about uh, John Andrew, the rector John Andrew, Jerry Hancock, the head of music, about music at St. Thomas. So I thought, those three themes each are really part of a slightly different century and a way to look at um, this wonderful history of the 200th anniversary. We're here to talk about new institutions adapting to a new nation and a new century. That was our theme last time and that's going to be our theme today. And I want to share a story about a prominent 19th century Episcopalian, George Templeton Strong, he was on the board of Columbia University. He was a vestryman at Trinity Wall Street. And in his diary, he describes the first Columbia commencement at which there had ever been any academic regalia. And he compared the president of Columbia and his colorful hood and all of this things academics wear. He said, he looks like a bird. <laughs> <laughs> so the next time you see an academic worthy or a clergy person in their full regalia, don't hesitate to get out your Peterson's Guide to Birds or open up your Merlin app and see what bird most resembles the dressed up person in front of you. I won't say that you do that in today's Eucharist at 11 o'clock, but just think about that someday. Try to match the person to the bird. Adjusting to new circumstances and new ways often ruffles a few feathers, so I hope that does not happen today, but here we go. <laughs> so let me give a brief recap of the first lecture for those who were not able to be here for it. My subject was John Henry Hobart. Bishop Wolf will tell you that Bishop Wolf and our Dodson Bishop are so sick of hearing me talk about Bishop Hobart, <laughs> they had to send me over here to talk about Bishop Hobart, which I tried to do, who is really the founder of St. Thomas who spent the last 19 years of his life, he died in 1830, in tireless work on behalf of the Episcopal Church, challenging the rise of Protestant evangelism, okay? It's not a little bit fair today. Uh, an evangelistic movement that was very, very powerful in American politics. So he thought the Episcopal Church should stand up against this rising 
uh, evangelical movement within the Baptists, the Presbyterians, and the Methodists, and other denominations. Hobart had the energy of 10 men, we're told. Horses dropped from exhaustion as he went around founding Episcopal churches. He baptized 15,000 people during his time as the Bishop of New York. And in those days, all of New York State was Hobart territory. So I'm his successor because I was the Bishop of Western New York. Jerry Wolf is his successor too because she's a bishop in Long Island. So all of us were part of one diocese in those days. Last week's lecture focused on two founding themes that are very important to me about Hobart. Number one, that for him, the Episcopal Church symbolized a combination of the dome of the U.S. Capitol representing democracy. We are a church in which the people elect the bishops and elect the rector and, and elect the vestry. But also, the church, it represents the dome of St. Peter's in Rome, representing the Catholic tradition, which we also inherit. So we're democratic, but we, co we combine democracy with Catholicism. And that was a clever line, and so I tried to use it on you, too. If you have to say, what do we stand for? We are a combination of both, which I think is a pretty good thing, that we have both dimensions in our church. And secondly, the Episcopal Church is a church of freedom, of we the people. The opening words of our Constitution also describe our understanding of the church. Again, the government of the church is in the hands of the people, not a monarch, which was, to be frank, the tradition of the Church of England. And there were four freedoms that Hobart talked about. Freedom from having to have a dramatic conversion experience to being a Christian. Number two, freedom for the requirement to sign an elaborate confessional creed. You're free within the basics of the Christian faith to believe, not to have to say what you think transubstantiation is or predestination. You hear what I'm saying? You didn't have to sign it. F freedom as a Christian to embrace science and learning as part of faith. And finally, freedom to have a good time. <laughs> the evangelicals didn't want you to, to have a drink. And I think one of the reasons the Episcopal Church rose in the 19th century was so why not have a drink, okay? It's so either wine or spirits to enjoy sports and friendship and the beauty of the world. These were all the founding principles of this parish church. He saw it as an outpost of what he believed. And the rumors go around that, oh, St. Thomas was in the 19th century a low church. It wasn't. It was a Hobartian high church and con continued so in the early 20th century. Please stay tuned later in the lecture for four freedoms of the Episcopal Church, which Cram believed in as well. And so now I turn to the second great figure who made possible the great church we are sitting in today. Ralph Adams Cram, the architect of this masterpiece, who, like Hobart, sought to provide an extraordinary expression of the Episcopal faith in the face of the other challenges of that time, the early 20th century. He wanted to put faith at the heart of New York City, and this was his location, and this was his building to do this. Then as now, it was a city of skyscrapers, secular values surrounding the church, and a renewed challenge to democracy, just as in our own time. It was an era of challenges to social justice. And, F and Francis Bluen is going to talk about that in his uh, lecture about Dr. Stiers, who was the rector, the importance of social justice to Dr. Stiers. And it was a time to express the recognitions of God's love and mercy for every member of the human community, regardless of race and ethnicity. Even though it was a time, we have to say, still of racism, Still, in the preaching of Dr. Stiers, these issues were addressed in the context of which the church was built. And it was a time of growing acknowledgement of the open place of what today we know as the LGBTQ community, men and women in the beloved community, of men and women in the exercise of the ministry of the church and the body of Christ. These things came later, you know that, in the late 20th century, in the early 21st century, but I believe there was the foundation of some of this aspect of the Episcopal Church in the early 20th century. 
Architecture was the means through which Cram wished to communicate this great treasure of the Episcopal faith to the population. And just as Hobart's mission was rooted in the struggle for survival of our church after the American Revolution, Cram's mission was rooted in tragedy, a church fire. In the summer of 1905, many members of St. Thomas had scattered to the mountains or the seashore. And Dr. Ernest M. Stiers, you'll hear more about in another lecture, who was the rector, he was in Lake George with his family. But on the morning of August 8th, the caretaker of the church perceived that the windows of St. Thomas were being brightly illuminated by Christmas Eve. But guess what? It wasn't Christmas Eve. It was a fire. And by the night, night time of the 8th, the church resembled an ancient Gothic ruin. The church had been completely destroyed. There were remnants of the church left. In the face of this tragedy, Dr. Stiers wished to see a new parish church rise from the ashes. He said, the people expect to see a new St. Thomas church, to be an inspiration, to be a noble church, and they were not to be disappointed. The minutes of the vestry of May 16, 1907 state, the plans for a new church on the same site were submitted and details thoroughly explained by Ralph Adams Cram. And so the firm of Cram, Goodhue, and Ferguson would build a new church on the corner of Fifth Avenue and 53rd Street. Cram was then in his early 40s. He began to earn a national reputation when he was hired as the architect. For St. Thomas, he said, we work steadily and seriously towards something more consistent with our temper and the times in which we live now. This forward-looking idea of the church. At the heart of the plan was a tower in which we're sitting right now. At the height of 15 stories, planned in such a way that it would dominate Fifth Avenue. <laughs> That's pretty good for a church, thank you. <laughs> what does that mean? We want to dominate Fifth Avenue. But he said, we want to dominate Fifth Avenue. Because he imagined that there would be all of these other buildings being built around. And he was right about that, right? He didn't want some little humble shack. He wanted a building proclaiming the Christian faith. And within this house of God, everything would lead to the magnificent Reredos, the altar screen behind the altar at the west end of the nave, 43 feet high with 80 figures, all contributing to the Christian message of the building. So the, the Reredos itself is filled with people, each of whom have a story, who explain the meaning of the Christian faith. Variations up there, go and look at them sometime. There was one living person who was put in the Reredos, the presiding bishop of those days, whose last name was Tuttle. And you know what you had to do to be the presiding bishop in those days? You just had to be the oldest bishop <laughs> at the church. So Jerry and I would be pretty close to being presiding <laughs> We were born in the same year. We will, I will, I'm old, slightly older than she is, but anyway. So what happened, you became presiding bishop when the oldest one died, and then the next oldest one came in <laughs> office. But he's up there until he was still alive then, so go look at him sometime. The plans were revised 12 times by the vestry. Can you imagine what those, <laughs> what those meetings were like? The major construction of St. Thomas was finished in 1914, the year the First World War broke out in Europe. So again, a time of challenge, just as the origin of the parish. It was important to Stiers, the rector, that the plan for the church directly address the social troubles of the day and the tragic war that had begun in Europe, and so you'll tell us much more about that. But he saw the church as almost a healing presence in the city, which of course had great things, but also social problems. This is what he said in one of his speeches. These and other similar problems of our age, the new St. Thomas must face with intelligence, sympathy, and courage. He said St. Thomas was giving to the world a contemporary church clothed with a mantle of inspiration, a masterpiece of craftsmanship, and a work of genius. I mean, these are pretty good themes to say we're going to build a church that's going to be filled with genius, craftsmanship, and inspiration. And that's what he thought the building was going to convey. On April 12, 25, 1916, 
this present church in which we're sitting was consecrated. And in his first service there, Dr. Stiers defined its purpose. St. Thomas humanizes science, moralizes knowledge, spiritualizes wealth, and inspires the highest patriotism. Isn't that a great message? I mean, if you're looking at people that what is our mission? I think that's a wonderful mission there. Uh, and these were the specific goals, I would say, of both Hobart and Ralph Adams Camp. And I can just say one thing uh, about Dr. Stiers on behalf of Bishop Wolf and me. He was later the Bishop of Long Island. So there's a kind of a Long Island thing here, right? <laughs> <laughs> and um, he was a very good Bishop of Long Island, I think. But you'll hear all more about him later. Cram was born in 1863 in New Hampshire. He never went to college, but he graduated from high school in Exeter, New Hampshire where he determined to pursue architecture, and in, in 1881, he headed to Boston. He opened his first architectural office in Boston in 1889, and he was still at work in his Boston office in 1942, when there weren't a lot of projects because you know, the Depression had almost ruined him. For 53 years, Cram did more than anyone else in the United States to popularize the use of Gothic architecture not only in churches and cathedrals, but in many institutions of higher learning, such as Princeton. So for 22 years, he was the chief architect of Princeton. So if you have time after this lecture, stay for church, but if you have time to get over to Princeton, please, after this lecture sometime, go and look at Princeton, which is, has this magnificent um, chapel that he also built, almost as beautiful as this church. The only problem is, Princeton is a Presbyterian university. <laughs> Somehow, he put, made, made little jokes inside, you'll see it. And this is a true story. Uh, when the COVID broke out, my, my wife Carmela and I were in uh, the Institute of Advanced Study at Princeton. And I would take a walk every day because during COVID, what did you do but walk around? And the campus was empty. I went to peek into the chapel and a skunk came out of the door of the chapel <laughs> and started chasing me. I said, that's all you need, an Episcopal bishop trying to get into this Presbyterian cathedral. <laughs> and there, there is the, this is an absolutely true story that this happened. But take a moment to envision the Gothic style developed in the 11th century, soaring height, vast spaces, elaborate carving, towers that urge the eye upward, all in service to the liturgy, and you can see why Cram would employ that vocabulary of the Gothic style to express the highest and best thinking and holy aspiration of the church. But he tried to adapt it also to modern concepts, to modernism. Just as our church combines democracy and Catholicism, he sought to combine the Gothic style with a modernist approach to what makes the 20th century work and how do you build a church for the 20th century. And that's what he did in this church. Cram was above all a man of vision, a poet, an editor, a playwright, an actor, a short story writer. He was an eminent scholar and an avid social commentator on the 20th century society's problems and the place of religion in society. He founded the, the magazine Commonwealth and he also was a founder of the Medieval Academy of America. He was everywhere. He was profiled in the New Yorker, can you imagine that? The, 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 the New Yorker doing a profile of a religious architect. And few architects were profiled ever, I think, in the New Yorker. He appeared on the cover of Time magazine in your handout. There you see him looking out to you, which is pretty rare for an architect as well. The day after his death, the White House issued a statement about his role and his, what he meant to our country. And the New York Times the next day had an editorial about him, not an obituary, which was a really great honor. And the New York Times said about him, out of the richness of his mind, he left a legacy of beauty to our city of New York. So these are pretty high accolades, I think. On top of all this, he was a great jokester. <laughs> At the consecration of Methodist and Presbyterian churches he had built as the architect, he would often put in the furnace incense. <laughs> <laughs> So the Methodists and the Presbyterians were assaulted by incense at the time. <laughs> I wish we had a recording of that, a little film of that. <laughs> Cram was the son of a somewhat eccentric and controversial Unitarian minister. 
like the first rector who had been born and raised a Baptist, so he was not born and raised an Episcopalian, but a Unitarian. His father was William Augustus Cram, who named him for Ralph Waldo Emerson, Emerson, who was a friend of his father. So he grew up in a world of liberal, Yankee, New England sturdiness. That's, he looks like that. Look at his picture. Doesn't he look like a Yankee? <laughs> How did Cram find his way into the Episcopal Church? He traveled in Europe in 1888-89 as a tutor to a friend's stepson. And in Europe, Cram gained a newfound vocation, both as an architect and as a Christian, while a touring Italian cities. Not a bad place <laughs> to discover Christianity, I was to say. Um, he came to be captivated by the beauty and the witness of the Catholic liturgical tradition while he was there, which he had not known anything about. He had a conversion experience to Catholicism in the Anglican mode at a Roman high mass on Christmas Eve in 1887 at the great church of San Luigi dei Francesi, which is close to the Piazza Navona and right across the street from the Italian Senate. So a great church for conversion. But also, I think most importantly, it is the home, the church is the home of Caravaggio's great painting of the calling of Matthew where uh, you may have all gone there and seen it when you've been in Rome, but in which Jesus is pointing directly at Matthew and, and saying, follow me. Uh, and he, Cram said, that night in Rome, I met Jesus Christ at the high mass. That's not a bad motto either. I met Jesus Christ at the high mass. And that's what he really proclaimed. And that's what he was trying to proclaim in this church, that other people would meet Jesus in the high mass of St. Thomas Church. When he returned to Boston in 1890, he found his spiritual home with uh, the Anglo-Catholic, very high church wing of the Episcopal Church, and he received instruction in the Christian faith for the members of the Society of St. John the Evangelist. They had been founded in 1863 at Oxford. They were part of the Oxford movement, the Catholic revival in our church. They were the first Anglican religious order since the Reformation. And in Boston, their headquarters were on Beacon Hill on Bowdoin Street, and their, their leader was Father Arthur Hall, who was basically the tutor to, to, a, to the catechumenate of Ralph Adams Cram. And he was baptized and confirmed, and his godfather at both baptism and confirmation was Charles Henry Brent. This is interesting to me. I'm the successor as the Bishop of Western New York of Charles Henry Brent. And, um, he was Cram's great, great friend and his sponsor. Cram designed his tombstone in Lausanne, Switzerland. Because he was the Bishop of Western New York, I can tell you, it snows in Buffalo. You've heard of this. <laughs> and winter is horrible. So he would usually take a two or three a month vacation in Lausanne during the winter. That, and that's where he died. And so that's why his, his tomb is there. Brent would go on to found the faith and order movement, and he would uh, continue all of Cram's life to, to guide him. For Cram, the 1890s were a decade of spiritual awakening as he embraced and was sp spiritually transformed by the Cowley Fathers and the Episcopal Church. But he underwent a second awakening, a period of self-knowledge in the same decade. He found a love of unconventional joy with a group of young Bohemians centered on Beacon Hill. Here he was surrounded by musicians, young, all in their teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, and founded by young musicians, composers, writers, painters, and critics, including the great art critic Bernard Berenson and his patroness Isabella Stewart Gardner, who was a big Anglo-Catholic, and architects like Henry Vaughan, who designed the National Cathedral in Washington, and Bernard Berenson. So, I mean, this is amazing. It was a Bohemia, but it was a Bohemia of geniuses on Beacon Hill. It is fair to ask what was Cram's sexuality as he spent this decade in a countercultural circle. He used to strut down Pinckney Street in a peacock blue suit, which he loved, in a purple tire. One vibe tells us. In other words, he, he, was, he was part of a bohemian group. He dressed like it. He lived like it. He loved it. It was transforming him. 
This is where he met Bertram Grosmuller Goodhue, who was his partner in building this church, with whom he would partner to design a few churches, then this church, and then they split. It's not easy to distinguish if this was a close, non-erotic friendship. It was, a, was it a business relationship, or is it something more, a time when homosexual identity was not fully recognized, but in fact, and maybe they were partners. But I, I'm not here to say yes or no. I'm here to say that this was a very important part of his life. It had something to do with his understanding of the Christian faith, that he felt that in this community of the Bohemia, he could be the person God had made him to be. He did not have to hide. This is important for Cram's vision of what the modern Episcopal church would look like and be like as he grew and went forward. And he was called by Amy Lowell, the first American avant-garde member. So again, if we think of him as a conservative, as this is conservative architecture, my argument today in this lecture is that's not exactly who he was. He was a forward-thinking person. It must have been an inspiration to meet and live with some of the most creative minds of the United States in the 1890s in Boston. Now, they had a good time. He loved to have a good time. They drank all night. They partied. Ta -da, ba -bum, ba -bum. But he, he combined with his Christian faith. He thought you could be an Episcopalian and have this kind of life. I believe that this led to Cram's ability to see the Episcopal Church as Hobart had seen it, as a place of freedom where people were free to be who they are, to enjoy music, theater, art, beauty, architecture, that was what he was trying to express here. And it's not a stretch to say that the buildings that he built, that he was the architect, expressed what was in his heart, that the church is a place of freedom to be whom God has created all God's human creatures to be, a beloved community. And it was be a church, I think that over time, over a century, grew out of this sense by many Episcopal Church members that led to the ordination of women and the consecration of openly gay priests and bishops in our own time. Today, we take it for granted that artists express their identity, including their sexual identity, in their creative work. But we should not be surprised if this was true as Cram as well. But the circumstances of Cram's life shifted at the dawn of the 20th century, in 1900, Cram married Elizabeth Carrington, a Virginia aristocrat, and the best man at his wedding was none other than his closest companion, Bertram Goodhue, who married Lydia Bryant two years later. In 1903 came the great triumph. The architectural firm of Cram and Goodhue won the competition to rebuild West Point, and that led to this job here, from West Point to here. Soon they were awarded the contract to rebuild St. Thomas after the fire. And certainly Cram was quick to seize the glittering prizes of these great New York projects now as he distanced himself from the bohemianism of his Boston life. He stayed in Boston, but Goody's uh, part of their office was down here. Just as Hobart believed that the Episcopal Church must stand against the influence of the Protestant evangelical movement in 19th century America, and by contrast, stand for Christian freedom, so also the Boston Bohemia gave this sense of Christian humanism, I believe, to Cram, and that we must stand for these values of freedom in life. And Cram came to see St. Thomas Church at the heart of the city that symbolized a new metropolitan culture of finance, invention, and capitalism. In its architecture and in its mission, this church should embody physically and in terms of its own life of worship here, the reality of Christian humanism for the 20th century. Christian humanism meaning our Christian faith translated into the quality of the lives that we lead. So as St. Thomas, this corner of Manhattan, not a paradise of Boston Bohemia, not a sylvan New England countryside, but the heart of the 20th century metropolis, which he felt should be the home of the Christian faith in terms of expressing this faith for the world, the modern world. At least sort of like, if I can overstate here, being St. Peter's in Rome, <laughs> it sort of expresses the Christian faith. He was thinking big. 
St. Thomas was the first project for which Cram found himself facing the task of designing a church in the crowded core of a world city. So he's increasingly modernist in aspects of this design as well. And Montgomery Seiler, a foremost scholar of American 20th century architecture, writing in the architectural record, defines St. Thomas as a thoroughly modernist building. Despite so many Gothic elements, its meaning is to be a, a modern building. Adapting the Gothic to hearing and participation needs of a modern congregation. And so on the exterior, designing a building that it could own its own, really, I would say, to, could fight against everything we see around us here, really, say, we represent X, you represent across the street something else. But also, a place that would welcome large crowds into the church as well. And the balconies, when I got here early, I got here a little bit too early, I went in and sat and for the first part of the 9 o'clock mass, and we're looking up exactly what he did. That balcony on the side, the chapels, all of those things were designed on purpose to bring the population in, to welcome people in. To underline the greatness of this achievement, it contrasts St. Thomas' fate with that of the church in which Bishop Hobart is actually buried, Trinity Church Wall Street. By contrast to St. Thomas, by the early 20th century, according to Henry James, Trinity Church Wall Street had been mercilessly robbed of any visibility in the city by its neighboring skyscrapers, in whose shadow, in Henry James' words, Trinity Church Wall Street had become a poor, ineffectual thing. Well, it's got six billion dollars in, in, in the <laughs> bank, but St. Thomas, as a building and an institution, adapted itself to new conditions, conforming in a measure to its environment, but also challenging its environment. Cram saw none of this as a problem, but as an opportunity. For Cram, the metropolis, whatever its evils, was more than a problem. It was perhaps the most challenging opportunity that a Christian Episcopal architect might covet, to express our faith for this moment, for this city. The modern city with its towers. The, ch the city church must find itself in Christian juxtaposition to new secular lofty structures and to a new secular lofty space. Cram's greatest achievement, the great mass of St. Thomas on this corner, I think still dominates this urban setting. To Cram, the principles of its design and its spiritual qualities would counter what he thought were the dominant, potentially dehumanizing, technocratic, individualistic, mercantile impulses of the 20th century. And I think you'll hear more of that about the, the vision of stars too. They were matched in that, fully engaged in this world. And so, what were his freedoms, his four freedoms? Proclaiming the identity and purpose and role and place of the Episcopal Church in modern society as a church of freedom, freedom of identity, freedom of association, freedom of inspiration, and freedom of beauty, Cram's four freedoms. No accident that Cram was an ardent supporter and admirer of Franklin D. Roosevelt, who also had his four freedoms, and of Hobart. The president of the four freedoms from whom Cram adapted his list of the four freedoms of the Episcopal Church. And when Cram died in Boston on September the 22nd, 1942, at the age of 70, Franklin D. Roosevelt, once a vestryman at St. James Church in Hyde Park, where Cram had done some architectural work, Franklin D. Roosevelt took time in the midst of World War II, the great crusade for world freedom, to issue from the White House his own testimony to Cram's greatness as an exponent of American freedom. I think we need to think about that. I mean, I've tried not to make this lecture political, but I think everybody sees some of the resonances of this, particularly I think we all look at the New York Times to say and see this story about <coughs> Navalny being killed in Russia. Navalny standing for freedom the way Roosevelt, Cram, and Hobart stood for freedom. I mean, this is, this is our job too. But what if the freedoms of the Hobart and Cram 
are lost by the Episcopal Church? What if we become like what's happened with some other Christian movements? What if beauty and worship, beauty and joy in liturgy and the heart of liturgy, what if beauty and music were lost by the worldwide church and by the American churches, as it is destined perhaps to do? What would happen to the mission of St. Thomas Church without your music and without your liturgy and without your beauty? Next Sunday, I will end my three lectures with the story of how those freedoms related to music and liturgy challenged in the 20th century survived at St. Thomas and made an impact on the Episcopal Church because of the ministry of Canon John Andrew and Dr. Jerry Hancock at the end of the 20th century when they, the two of them fought for beauty and wanted St. Thomas to be an outpost, a liturgical and musical beauty, and it obviously was with architectural beauty. Music and liturgy that match this work of genius that surrounds us. Thanks be to God for these great figures we've been privileged to talk about and given you this church. I mean, you should be, I think. You get to worship here and be part of it. And I hope to see you next Sunday for the last chapter of this three-part story. Thank you. Well, I tried to end a little bit for some questions about this. It's a lot. <laughs> okay, yes. The Reridus was from the preceding church. Yeah. How did they? No, it was, it was cut new for the. Yes. Yeah. Wow. It was designed for, for that purpose. What happens to you when you walk in to the church? What do you see? You, you're overwhelmed, I think, by that. Okay. Uh, Bishop, I'm tremendously informed and inspired by your message. Uh, I am a cradle Lutheran clergyman okay. <laughs> who is in the process probably of affiliating with the uh, Episcopal Cathedral in Portland, Maine. Okay. And we, my wife and I both uh, mm -hmm. sing Anglican chant with the choir. <laughs> All right. and, and, thoroughly enjoyed. Here is my concern, and I'm tying into your point about Hobart being opposed to the, uh, some of the even evangelical yeah. using right. the modern yeah, right. 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 Protestantism mm -hmm. and the conversion. Yeah. Well, he did experience a conversion experience. He yeah. can be at a high mass instead of at a camp. Yeah, yes, yes. Okay, now here's my concern, and I wonder if you'd speak to it yeah. in, and thinking of your, of the tradition, yeah. and of your ministry, and the ministry of this church, which for 30 years has been our favorite church <laughs> in New York City. Okay, yes. I am concerned that the Episcopal Church, and especially the more it focuses on beauty and tradition, right. the smaller becomes <laughs> its potential yeah. Uh, ministry within American society. Yeah, yes. What do you say about this, and how can it become the broadly inviting right. and accepting and attracting church yeah. to the many instead yeah. of the few? Well, that's a wonderful question, and we could have a whole conference on this question. <laughs> I think. I mean, I, I, we, but, but then, but I think, but absolutely, I mean, that is our challenge. That is, the, I think Bishop Wolf could get up and give a lecture on this too. That how do we do this? I mean, St. Thomas is in some ways unique with the resources it has, its location, and all of this. But how in little churches in Long Island that we go to all the time can we? But somehow we are doing it. I think. I don't think our. Our diocese is disappearing, do you? I mean, for, far from it. And we're trying to base it on these things. I, I hope I didn't go overboard too much talking about the evangelical movement. People do have conversion experiences. I chair our ecumenical <laughs> commission for the Episcopal Church, so I believe in our relations with other churches. But what I've tried to do in this, these lectures is talk about St. Thomas, and it's upholding these principles for all these years that say we stand for these things, and this is what if I can say, American needs. Now, the Episcopal Church has, we have branches in 16 countries, so it's not just America, but it seems that this moment is crying out for some of the themes we've been talking about today, that we have to, and I think liturgy and beauty and music, all of those are part of the humanizing thing that I've been talking about as well, as well as our welcome of all people. I mean, that, 
We've lost a lot of members because of that. You know that. And I think this sense of standing for the beloved community in which all are welcome, but based on the principles of the, the, the principles of our church uh, through the years. And I think you have the right, you have a moment you're being called to do this. And I, I was told that, uh, I'm trying not to be too political here, but uh, when John Meacham was here, he, he made a reference to your neighbor down the street in Trump Tower. Trump. But what I'm just saying, that's, that's sort of, Cram would love that. that there's <laughs> Trump Tower, this is St. Thomas Tower. You know what I'm saying? Jerry, help, help me get out of the. That if you think of the whole church, St. Thomas has a unique niche in the whole church which no other church in this city can fulfill. Right. But there are other churches that have their own perspective and their own niche. So I think that needs to be taken into consideration as well. That's right. Could yes. I have a slight follow-up? Please do. Uh, These are great questions. One of the things that was off-putting for the three women in my immediate family was, and which at times inclined us a little more towards St. Bart's, <laughs> is the minimal presence, especially in the liturgy, in fact, the non-presence of women up to about 10 years ago. Yeah, well, Do that's you another. Do comment on that? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Except, it's, I would say it's changing. It's changing. I, I would say it's changing. It's changing. Very much changing. Uh, could you say a little bit more about his understanding of why Gothicism was important in the transition from the Romanesque, which was, he was obviously about yeah. seeing Trinity in Boston all the time. Right. You didn't mention where he got, went to church. I, in Boston, that's a very good question, and I don't, I, I don't know the answer. I, to that. I, would just I don't think it was, I mean, I don't think it was Trinity Church. But I, we do know in, in saying that Gothicism was or I think we do, and I'm just sort of like in right. Italy, they're from that the Gothicism was more appropriate to represent Protestant Christianity over the Roman use yeah, of that. The but I, I think I think it was the sense of height. I think it was the sense of open, large open spaces. Mm -hmm. I think these were the what you see downstairs, where more people could come and be. be and it was a city architecture too, as he felt. I think, and a simple architecture too, and was rooted in. England, where we are rooted in terms of our own um, style of cathedrals and churches. So I think these were all, but that's a wonderful question, a great question. Why did he go to church? I'm sorry, I can't answer. If somebody can answer that for me, Jerry. Perhaps say, uh, John, uh, John the Evangelist. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, but I think he did that when he was young, earlier, maybe, uh, and also um, the Church of the Advent, probably. The Church of the Advent was a very Anglo-Catholic church on Beacon Hill, too. So, but I, I don't, haven't found a lot of information about after he was baptized, confirmed, got on the road, you know what I'm saying? So, you're asking wonderful questions for, okay. Um, the verticality of, of the Gothic style of, uh, appealed to yes. modern, dense, yeah. tall cities. Yeah. And you only had to look at Lincoln Cathedral, yes. which is referred to as the skyscraper cathedral. Yes, that's right. The tallest building in the world yes. for yes. Several hundred years. Yeah, but I think of, isn't Cesar Pelli who designed the MoMA skyscraper just down the block? I mean, the way the tower and the mass really do, are in conversation with Cesar Pelli. I mean, that's a, a stroke of genius that, that Cram somehow thought that would happen. L luckily, you have a beautiful neighbor, <laughs> All right, I think. But others around. How much time do we have? We have only two minutes left. Okay, so, so maybe we should stop. We should uh, wrap up. <laughs> and uh, in any case, um, we, at co we at coffee hour. Uh, via coffee hour, uh, after mass, and uh, it's coming next week. So, yes. uh, so uh, I think we can thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. And thank you for these wonderful questions. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. I wanted to tell you that, of course, most um, Bostonians and 